<laughs> so, uh, this talk is about understanding the impact of current hash collision attack. And as a side effect, show that MD5 is really broken. And this talk is not about cryptography. I don't understand cryptography. It's not about the internals of hash collisions, only their impact. So no Greek, no LaTeX, no whatever. And it's not about new cryptographic attacks. It reuses all attacks, but some of them were never exploited. So it's a high-level talk about understanding the problem. And tomorrow, there is a hands-on workshop to, be, to actually understand the impact of these intact, uh, attacks and then exploit them. So if you want hands-on stuff, it's tomorrow. So this talk is a joint effort by Mark Stevens and I. And Mark Stevens is the cryptographer uh, behind all these attacks. So uh, you can watch his talks, if, but it's so complex, it's not funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... And I don't understand all this stuff, but he's great enough to be able to explain to me. And he also provides ready-to-use tools to, to perform these attacks, which is pretty awesome for academics, if you ask me. And these are our own views, not from any of our employers. So first, I will explain what's a hash collision. And then I will go in detail about MD5 and explain with a uh, high level how it works, how these things work. So a hash function like MD5 or SHA-1 that sometimes you see called a checksums is something that takes some content and then uh, return a big fixed value that is always very different. And a small content ch uh, change creates a huge difference in the hash value. So, which in practice, it's impossible to guess the content from a hash value. So if you take a known hash and you just change it even a bit, we, it's not feasibly possible to actually guess the content that will create such hash. And another property is that if two contents have the same hash, they are assumed to be identical if the hash is secure. So, for example, a common way to explain a hash and is like indexing your pictures in the cloud. They are maybe referenced with a diff each of them has a different number. And in practice, it should be that every time uh, the 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 for a given hash and value, there is a specifically given file. So it's another way to store a secret, like a password, without sharing the actual value of this password, and you, so that you can compare without leaking. And it's also used in a real, like uh, if you download VLC, they give you the checksum, the SHA-256 checksum, well, I mean hash function, cryptographically hash function, uh, to validate the, that you indeed uh, the, got the result, the file you were supposed to. But sometimes there is a hash collision, especially in non-cryptographically secure hashes. Uh, for example, here with a small, uh, easier hash function. So what is a hash collision in practice? It's a computation that generates two distinct contents with the same hash. And we can define some part of the contents. It's not about controlling the final result of the hash. Uh, it's, a hash collision in practice happens a lot of randomness. So for example, this is a collision, a MD5 collision of the word yes and no. So only a few bytes of planned stuff and there are like a lot of bytes of random looking data. So on both sides, there is a lot of data that has a very high entropy and with only tiny differences on each side. So just for yes and no, you obtain this huge amount of randomly looking data. Which means that a hash collision, if you, is a big pile of computed randomness with tiny differences. In the case of these attacks, at least. So, which means that you cannot generate with a given hash, you cannot generate a file that will have this hash. You cannot plan this advantage. It's called a pre-image attack. And this doesn't even exist for MD2 in practice, even if MD2 is very old. Uh, it was pro, uh, for Maraca and Sneflu. It was actually implemented, but that's very rare. So again, it's not, oh, there is this hash. Can we have a content, have this hash without knowing the content in advance? No, there's no such attack. It doesn't exist. So. Uh, because of their construction, hashes like MD5 or SHA-1 or 2 work by processing blocks from start to end. So it's really like a Tetris game. And a property is that as soon as you have two contents that have the same value, then if you append at, at uh, block boundaries, if you append some suffix that is the same, the hash will va keep the same, being the same. This is a very important property. So when you have, uh, you have two colliding contents, adding an identical suffix to both sides maintains the same hash on each side, even though if, once again, we don't know what the final hash will be, but we know that both hashes will be equal. Uh, 
So these attacks work with this kind of blocks, always align on, in this case, 64 bytes. So you give us some content, there is some padding so that you fill some blocks, again, until 64 bytes. Then every pair of files have the same length, and the end of the file is very, has a very strong fingerprint similarities. Either they have a suffix, in which case both ends of the files are absolutely identical, or if there is no suffix, then it just ends with the collision blocks that we saw earlier, which is like they have a very high entropy and uh, they, are, they have tiny differences at specific offsets, which is like a very strong giveaway that these two files have a hash collision. So even if you would get such a file, without having the other, this would be indicate that it's uh, uh, probably a hash collision. I mean, this is, this is pretty unusual in most files anyway, without some kind of visible identifier. The, the hash doesn't pre plan in advance the content of these values here. So let's first see the easiest way, the easiest type of collision, the identical prefix. As it says, it has a prefix that will be identical to both files. So we define the start of the file, and then the collision computation will depend on that. The prefix can be empty, the current prefix can be extremely long, it can be full of zeros, it can be completely very high entropy, it doesn't make any difference. There's no shortcut in, with any size of prefix. It just gives different start values, that's all then you need to pad the prefix to some length of a block. So in this case, in the case of these files, a multiple of 64. And then there will be computation of two collision blocks that will ha have, again, high entropy with very tiny differences between each side. And despite the differences, the hashes of both files is the same. So as you can see, it's a weird computation that create the, this, which creates two different contents, and that still gives two files with the same hash. So it's breaking the, 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 hash, fun, the, the, the hash function in the, for collision-wise, but it's not, um, how can I say? But it's very, it has a very restricted structure. And the collision blocks only work for that prefix. If you change a single bit in the prefix, or even in the padding, which is considered prefix here, then you need to recompute everything. There's no shortcut, there's no reusability in this case. The computation only works specifically for this value, for this prefix. And then, again, this is not a computation uh, operation. Once you did your computation, then you can add whatever you want on both sides. As long as it's identical, then the hash value will remain, remember the same, re remain the same. So, as we saw, the prefix is identical on both sides. The suffix is identical on both sides, and then the collision blocks are full of randomness with only very tiny differences. So it's like uh, either it's identical, either you don't control much about the files. So the file, uh, um, yeah, that's uh, and again, I will call that IPC for identical prefix collision, and it takes a single impute, the common prefix. So this is the actual uh, collision of uh, two. Um, if you say here is a file with a few with a few bytes, then you have some padding until 64 bytes, and then you have the two collision blocks full of randomness, the two blocks of 64 bytes, and then just very tiny differences between each side, and the rest is actually is again random generated by the by the computation. Now the other type of collision is much more powerful. You take this time two files, any pair of files, and again their content absolutely don't mat doesn't matter at all. And then you will pad the both uh, the shortest to the longest, and then you'll add some padding. You compute different blocks for each side, and then you up you append this block. So it's a bit the same, except that the padding have different length if the suff if the prefix have different length, and the prefix can be whatever you want in this case. But this attack is uh, of course more computationally intensive than the other. So the second type of collision just takes two prefix, then you append something to both to make get them get the same hash. Here it can work with any file. So. And there is, in practice, such attack for MD5, so you know that you can take any pair of files in the world, and uh, just you can, after a few hours of computation, get some content with something appended that will get, and the, the two contents will get the same hash. 
And again, there's no shortcut on the size or the content of the prefix. So again, now you can see a bit differently the collision of yes and no. So with the padding, with just a different length because yes is longer than no. And then some random buffer, which is due, uh, used for the attack. And then a lot of randomly looking b uh, bytes with some, uh, uh, how do you say, with some differences on each side. But still, you just, so it can work with any content in input, but in, it still gives some files a weird structure if you look at them inside. So now, the common points of these two attacks is that, again, we work with alignments of 64 bits, and then there is some padding, then there is some computing which happens a few random looking blocks, and then anything that is put after is either identical or it's another collision. So, these files have different content, can have different content. They ha can, may have the same hash, but from a file structure perspective, they have some very strong giveaway at the end. Now, what does, how does that apply? What about MD5? It wasn't MD5 like killed 11 years ago? Because in 2008, they produced this incredible attack. Uh, to actually craft a rogue uh, SSL certificate. So what they did was make a certificate, make some structure signed so that they could swap it and the, uh, the certificate was signed with the MD5, which means, um, you could swap some contents by crafting in advance the structure. You could swap some content unknowingly of the signature authority. So basically, they created, they make some special thing being signed that looked benign to the signature authority, but then they could swap the, con the, the metadata to say this uh, SSL certificate can do whatever it wants. So it was unknowingly of the signature authority because, again, MD5 was weak. It was not an easy feature. They required 200 PlayStation 3 signing at an exact second, and they had to plan in advance two days before the computation, and they tried four times. So it was really like launch at the exact second and hope that the serial number will exactly would be what they plan in advance. So it was like really impossible mission style, but it worked in practice, and the signing authority didn't know about it. So it should have been dead, right? And then, effectively, it was banned for certificate, and MD5 was considered broken for security, for infosec, and for cryptographer. So there was no more research on MD5, right? But it doesn't mean that MD5 is still weak for some non-cryptographically use. Like if you have a username and you just want to re to generate a small random number from it. MD5 can be still be used, so it's not that MD5 is, bo is bad for all cases, but at least not for cryptographic stuff, right? So that's why there are still, even in Google, many use of MD5, but not for indexing files or for uh, anything like generating a key or anything like this, okay? So... Uh, the, the, uh, there was another, also another attack that was very interesting in 2015 against protocols. There is still a bit of research against MD5, but still no one was really interested, right? It was called kill, consider dead for good, right? So was it really dead? Well, it's not dead. And um, the reason for all my research was that uh, last year, there was this document that was saying basically indexing uh, artifacts for incident response is okay with MD5. And then I was like, because people are like, hey, it's still better than CST32, right? And in case, by default, use MD5, right? You can select to use SHA-1, but there is a recommendation, hey, MD5 is faster, and it's better than CST32 anyway. So that's why I was like, hey, let's really, how efficiently can one make collision with standard file formats if people are going to be incriminate, incriminated because someone used NK and uh, indexed files with MD5? Then what I would do is that, well, the moment you want a picture from me, I collide, I can make instant collision of the picture you want with a, in, with a picture you don't want on your hard disk that I could sue you for or some, anything. And then I send you the both files, like the collision instantly to you. And then you cannot prove if it's indexed by MD5 that you don't have the malicious file. You cannot prove that you don't have it because the, the both files are equal from an FD5 perspective. So if you think that people are going to be jailed because of MD5 is used for incident response, then uh, yes, it's dangerous. So what, um, what I mean here by any possible means is that with the existing attacks for which you can pre-compute some reusable prefix and also combine that with file tricks to make things go faster. 
So now MD5 won't die because it's still used by people. So instead, let's focus on each place where it's used and focus and see how quickly we can kill it when it's used on some specific file types. That was my research, right? So our contribution uh, with the help of Mark Stevens was uh, instant collision of PDF, PNG, JPEG, MP4. So I absolutely wanted to collide smells like teen spirits, video, and the parody. So you just download the videos from YouTube. You have instantly uh, uh, two uh, videos showing each of the content and the same MD5. It's instant. And also with other format, GIF, Windows executable, which is pretty fun. So you can instantly get WannaCry and your favorite game having the same MD5 if you want. And it's not, again, it's not just new collisions. It's not new collisions, new tricks. And, but here I made that they are instant reusable. So take any pair of files, you can be done on the fly. And for example, the colliding PDFs are 100% standard. And we'll see this slide deck is actually of the presentation is actually also containing the slide deck of tomorrow's workshop. And you can swap them because it's also an HTML polyglot. I will show that later. And uh, the con from a parser, the contents are unmodified. It's just whatever content you put in, in you, you, you use as input, it will be unmodified. Only the files are weird. But it also works perfectly with the uh, Hacklu files. So as you can say, it, uh, as you can see, it takes less than a second. I mean, it's really instant to actually collide two JPEG or two PNGs from the website, and then you end up with files having the same hash. So another thing I saw with uh, hash collisions is that because all hash collisions so far were always applying only to a pair of files, only two files, and of the same file types, and also the colliding files are expected to be very different. Well, I had some fun, and I'm not, not sure if you're familiar with poker, POC or GTFO, but what about an instant and generic polyglot collision tree of several file types? And uh, POC or GTFO 19 was indeed a PDF, which is also colliding with a PDF viewer so that it can view itself, and a PNG showing the diagram of the collision, and a video showing a collision, a near collision. So you have an instant collision of a document, an executable, an image, and a video just with MD5. So this file is available online to demonstrate that it doesn't necessarily apply only to two files or only to the same file type. Or you can do inside out because usually the files colliding are very different. And you can do it the other way around. You can, a previous issue of POC or GTF4, issue 14, was actually containing 609 collisions so that the file could display its own hash on the front page. And this was also a Nintendo polyglot that could also show its own hash when booting it under an emulator, because why not? And also, it also worked with SHA-1, and another issue of POC or GTFO was reusing the computation that takes 6,000 years core of computation so that the two issues, the two version of the issues have the same hash, SHA-1 hash, by reusing the same prefix that were computed a few years ago. And, uh, but even though it's a the, the document generated with LaTeX. So don't be fooled. Shortcuts are necessary. There are always file tricks for all these, tri these new exploitations because we can you just the exploitation itself doesn't give instant collision. I'll explain it a bit more. Some formats have no suitable tricks. For example, for ELF, MACO, and ZIP, there is no instant collision that I know of. But the good thing is that if these tricks work with MD5 and SHA-1, then the day they, they will be a new, uh, there will be a collision attack against SHA-2, then instantly we instantly know that there will be this, this uh, file format tricks can be reused. So it's pretty motivating for me. And some tricks have been actually reused over different collision attacks, over different hashes. So the same JPEG trick was used for MD5 and for SHA-1. So it's good because the, the file tricks remain usable. Now, uh, a good thing, I, uh, why I like it so much is that it's in collisions just combines some standard abuses trick that are not exclusive to collisions. So for example, to file format manipulation tricks. So normalizing content, hosting parasite data, and abusing parser tolerance, it's a good experience for your hacking skill. And I was working at Google and looking at MP4 file format for a specific project, and I was like, how do I know that, and how can I prove that I know this format a bit? You know, well, by making collision. Once you make collision, you have some result that 
people understand. It's not, hey, I found the bug and it was fixed, but it's like, yeah, I know this format a bit enough so that to make manipulation, for example, instant collision is a good first base in your relation with the file format. So there are not so many hash collision attacks, especially, I mean, I will, co I will cover all of them tomorrow. So fast call takes a few seconds that we saw earlier. Uh, no, we didn't see it earlier. Sorry. It's very hard to exploit, but it's instant. Unicall is m more powerful and takes a few minutes. And hash clash, a chosen prefix collision, is almighty, but takes a few hours. And on, on the other hand, for SHA-1, well, it still takes a few thousand years, so I'm not sure someone of us who is going to compute another prefix. But it was computed once uh, in 2017 by Google. So an important example is that this is the result of fast call that I showed earlier. And as you can see, so this is, this is very uh, instant. It takes um, it can take less than a second to compute, but the problem is that you have a lot of differences and, the pro and then you only have a few different bits between each side, which means it's very hard to exploit. So instant computation doesn't give you, it generates too much randomness, which is hard to exploit or impossible to exploit, so too many restrictions for most file formats. So instant co collision doesn't give you instant exploitation. You need something more. So that's why you need something to plan in advance regarding file format specification and tricks. So I'm not going to dive. This is for tomorrow for the workshop. But in general, structure, in general, the file formats have a header and body and footer structure. So the header has to be at the start of the file, which defines stuff like file types and versions and metadata. And the body comes after and very importantly is made of several sub-elements that we can move around with some freedom. And the footer just has to be after the body. And the important thing is that once the footer is there, then what is ignored is usually, what is, comes after in the file is usually ignored. So you can put like two bodies and one will be ignored if there was a footer that was passed in between. So you take a, to make a reusable collision attack, you take a specific file format and you find a way so that the header works with most of the files and then you pre-compute some prefix that will match this special header, this common header, and then you use the difference in the computed collision to have two different bodies that will be enabled or disabled. So the collision blocks act like a switch act, uh, activating one or the other body of the original files. So in practice, two files, you take two files with each their foot body and the footer, and you use a common header that is a bit similar. I mean, there are some restrictions, but it is similar to both that can work with both. And you, of course, may have to remove some features, but it still makes the, it may still makes the file valid. And then, of course, you will have some padding and the collision block, as we saw previously. But you craft the header so that the collision, the differences in collision blocks is taken into account. And then you put the original body and footer, and you make it so that the collision block acts like a switch for regarding one or the other version of the body. Again, I'm not going to go into details. It's for the, full, the, for the workshop tomorrow. But you, you have to find a way to make the collision work with the file format. So at a high level, if we do that with a PNG, PNG is the simplest file format from a high level perspective. It's a signature, then a sequence of chunk. What's important is that a chunk can be a command. So basically, and a command is just meaning ignore the next X bytes. So you just define a, a comment that has a length so that it's exactly at the place where there's a difference in the collision block so that the, 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 the comment will have two different lengths into, uh, so that will hide some content or not. And then you push the original chunks of the first file on one side, uh, and then the original chunks of the second file, and this will be activated or not. So in one version with a short command, it's just two commands that are ignored. Then it will see all the original chunks of the first file. Then it will see, hey, this is a valid image. And in the other case, the command, one com the command overlapping the collision blocks will be longer. It will, it will hide the comment, the content of the first file. And so therefore the second file will be rendered. These two files are valid according to the specs. So a question I was asked a lot was how to prevent such exploits. Then the important thing is to enforce a file size at the bit declaration of the file or a structure length or parent length. Like, so for example, 
all, uh, length of all the substructures of the file and the CRC. C PNG actually has some CRCs, but they are usually not enforced. And of course, here we have this weird structure that these two comments next to each other. If your parser is uh, rejecting any files that has more than one comment, or this comment contains high entropy content, then you can prevent uh, such exploitation to spread. And also, so yes, that's what, uh, that's what I meant. If you limit the number of comments or if you forbid appended data, for example, here, this is perceived as appended data, then this file will be considered invalid. So you can prevent some exploitation in the specs of your next file format or in the implementation of the parser you're currently writing to prevent such attacks because otherwise it can be still pretty difficult. But if you want more, I mean, tomorrow here, the workshop, but it's also available online, then uh, it's better to have, so not only I provide here the theory, the proof of concept and the script to create your own proof of concept, but also the workshop materials. So there's my website, my, my page on collisions that contains everything I know about Hush Collision, including test files. And the slides of the workshop are actually already available, so even if you don't, cannot attend the workshop tomorrow, then the slides are already available and you can learn them by yourself. You can study them by yourself. So, as a conclusion, well, that's if you jumped to the conclusion when reading the slides offline. Remember, it's impossible to, give, to match a given hash. The final hash of a collision is unknown in advance. The size of the files to be collided have no influence on the computation. At this stage, MD5 computation can be red. Which one? The last one. Last one, red? Ten minutes ago. It's okay, carry on. Okay. Yeah, I'm almost gone. Anyway, so I didn't see. You have a day at 7:30. Yes, you're that's good. good. So MD5 collision can be instant. SHA-1 is doable if you're a government entity or something like this. MD5 plus SHA-1 is not so much secure, but Mark Stevens still consider the SHA-2 family a lot stronger. Now, please, at least don't take some risk. Collision, colliding, if you're not sure, colliding standard files can be trivial and instant. I provided lots of script to demonstrate that, so don't play with fire, don't use MD5. And really, it was very fun for Mark and I to play with MD5. We don't consider it a cryptographic hash anymore, but a toy function. And actually, Mako created a hash collider, an MD5 generator on Mega Drive, which I ran last week. So I bought a Mega Drive uh, rep repro and a programmable cartridge. And the first run thing I ever ran on this console and this cartridge was this hash collider, which took two hours to compute, but it works. So a console from 88 can compute in two hours, a hash collision for MD5, which is even more recent. So just, uh, it's fun to collide MD5. Don't play with fire. Don't use with MD5 if you don't know what you're doing. And again, even when two, 11 years ago, uh, there was a chosen prefix collision, MD5 is still, still used wrongly. So provide pro, uh, exploitation proof of concept to convince people is much better than theory. And the good thing is that these attacks are reusable so it's even worth researching right now. And remember, it's our job to go out there and educate people, right? If we don't, then who will? And kill MD5 wherever it may hide. So thank you for your, for your attention. And if you have any questions. Hello. Oh, any questions? No, I can't believe it. He's yes, there is one here. Well, but, uh, he's hiding. Oh no! no. <laughs> Can you go back on slide? Uh, so my my question is uh, regarding collisions in both uh, SSH one and MD five flow. So how it's hard to make the collision, uh, which uh, when uh, SSH one and MD five will be uh, together the same for uh, two types of fi two ty two files. So the command that MD5 plus SHA-1 is not much stronger is from Mark Stevens. So if you want him to create the attack, just contact him directly. I definitely cannot answer this question. But he officially stated that it's not much stronger. He probably wasn't challenged enough. So <laughs> Screenshots or it never happened? Sorry? Screenshots or it never happened? Well, I, I cannot do the cryptographic part. Definitely can't. <laughs> Any... Any further questions? 
in the room. Okay, well, then. So I'm giving you the program for what I plan to do next because the workshop was a bit too advanced. So I'm planning an easier level workshop on file format exploitation and also a talk about uh, how to design a good, a good or not a good file format. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much.